As uh, Helen said, we're in a series called What We Believe uh, Matters, and we're looking at the nine articles of faith. We've got these nine statements of faith, these nine articles, core doctrines of what we say uh, matter. They're critical uh, to, to faith, uh, to identifying uh, with the Christian church, and, and they bring us together. They, they identify us as a community that emerges uh, out of the gospel, uh, that emerges out of a faithful uh, witness to Scripture. And so today we are looking at probably one of Christianity's most uncomfortable and maybe most misunderstood claims, and that is the fallen and sinful lost estate of all human beings, excluding Christ. The doctrine of sin sounds like a bucket full of fun, doesn't it? Aren't you glad uh, you came here this morning for this one? Uh, If you're new or just visiting, you're like, oh, of all the weeks I chose to come to Freeway. Hey, let's pray and then we'll get at it. Loving God, we want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to come together. Your people uh, gather together to, uh, as we've been singing praises to you, uh, this opportunity to look across the room and see people whose hearts have been uh, turned from uh, sin towards warmth and affection for you, this incredible transformation that you make possible uh, through your son Jesus and today our hope is as we look into this doctrine of sin of what went terribly wrong with humanity uh, that rather than just feeling this horrendous uh, finger pointing towards us that we would also exceed the grace uh, that that you have woven in uh, to dealing with that as well Uh, would your spirit um, just speak truth to us this morning Uh, we pray this in Jesus name Amen. Well, uh, great sociologist or cultural observer, uh, probably not so much now, but when I was growing up, Steve Tyler, uh, lead singer of Aerosmith, uh, he said, well, actually, he sang, he sang this, uh, something's wrong in the world today. I don't know what it is. There's something wrong with our eyes. Now, Steve Tyler has not gone out on some crazy limb here as he, as, he, as he sings about his perception of the human race and what's going on. It's not a radical line of thought. In fact, I'd say it's a pretty universally held uh, idea, and, it, and it's universally sung about, incredibly. Something has gone uh, terribly wrong, or something is terribly wrong with the world, and everybody knows it. Human beings do terrible things to each other. Spouses marry. Spouses bonded at uh, the most intimate level can somehow betray or wound and destroy uh, each other. People around the uh, globe are sexually exploited, commercially exploited, uh, ethnically exploited to attain so that people, others can obtain wealth and power. We abuse and mismanage our environment to increase our own comfort. And no amount of therapeutic uh, or legislated behavior modification or white-knuckle determination changes this. Despite our best laws, despite our best philosophies and efforts, the condition still persists. Why? Why is the the great question? In our reading today, we get uh, the reason from the Bible's historic account. Here we learn what went wrong in creation that has led to the human experience that is universal uh, to all people. Why something is terribly wrong. Terribly wrong in us, terribly wrong in the world. In the biblical account, we learn uh, that terribly wrong, though, is not the natural state of humanity, of the human experience, but something that uh, was never intended for us, but it has become a part of our human nature. In Genesis 3, in our reading today, we learn of what is called the fall. Uh, humanity's decision to rebel against this good order, this perfect creation, through a failure to love and to trust God. That He, that God had created us and given us all that we need to be fully human without inadequacies, without insecurities, no lack of ability to pour ourselves uh, out meaningfully and authentically, and no lack of, of, of ways in, to be poured into, to, to, to receive and have meaning. 
This failure is what the Bible most commonly calls sin. Sin is often a word that comes with a whole lot of religious freight, a whole lot of uh, Hollywood imagery, you know, the classic sex, drugs and rock and roll, bad people uh, doing bad things and moralistic religious pointy people pointing out the bad things that people are doing. Sin is a word that makes us uncomfortable. So, so often the Bible that speaks about sin, that brings sin to our attention, is, is pushed to the side as having nothing valuable to say because, well, you know, it's an ancient book. It's out of touch. It's irrelevant. Something that Tim Mackey, he's a Bible project guy, says in, this is a classic understatement. That is really unfortunate. Because it is through words like sin and others that the Bible writers use, the biblical writers are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of the human nature, of the human condition, of the why there is something terribly wrong. Sin is not the only word that the Bible uses to describe the wrong. The Bible uses other words. It uses words like uh, iniquity to describe behavior that's crooked. It uses words like transgression to describe behavior that breaks trust and other words. But the Bible's most common description of what is wrong with us in the world is sin. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament words that we translate into sin from both these uh, texts in their original context mean Uh, to miss the mark, to fail at something, or or to miss a goal. It's, it's It's not actually a religious word. It's a word borrowed from everyday life to describe how humans do just that, miss goals. And the Bible uses it to describe how we miss the goal of creation. Earlier, we would read in Genesis, earlier before the reading that we had this morning, we read that humanity is created sacred. Uh, sacred being, read about that in Genesis 1.26, created in the image and the likeness of God to faithfully bear witness to the character of God and to live under the love of God and then to live in mutual uh, uh, complementary love to one another and as they do that to live over the earth as its stewards, as its guardians. This is the goal of creation, love and enjoy God and be shaped by that love and out of that love then go and love and enjoy each other and care for creation and sin destroys all of these relationships uh, flips them upside down turns them on their head so sin is first and foremost relational opposition to God his goal for creation Sin, before it is anything else, before it is all the the tragedies and the terrors and all these descriptive lists that we get throughout the New Testament and Old Testament, it is a failure to love and to trust God, resulting in a failure to love and respect each other. That this is the case becomes concrete. It's actually stone, a stone reality. When God gives humanity ten commandments, a blueprint, for hitting, to mark, for hitting the mark of, of how uh, we ought to live in contrast to the way sin has uh, been bending us towards living. While there are 10 of these goals, the 10 commandments, they fall roughly pretty evenly into two basic camps. Four of them identify ways, if we think about it negatively, identify ways in which we can fail to miss the mark at loving God. And then the rest, the other six, identify ways in which we can fail, miss the mark of loving people. This is also why when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? What is it that humanity should do? What is it that is right? What are we designed for? In Matthew's gospel, in Mark's gospel, in Luke's gospel, they give the account of of Jesus' response, of what he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law, all the prophets hang on these two commands. This is the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament, the law and everything rolled up into two commands. They specifically roll out of Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. On repeat throughout Scripture... 
sin is always seen as being primarily against God and often resulting in uh, a failure to honor and love people as we are designed to. It's always relationally messed up. In Genesis 39.9, uh, when Potiphar's shady wife, the wench that she is, uh, that's not in the Bible, I just put that in there. Uh, she's, no, she tries to uh, force Joseph to sleep with her. And then Joseph responds to her, the only thing that my master has told me that is off limits is you, his wife. And he says, how could I do such a great wickedness and sin against God? In 1 Samuel 26, 21, we find Saul, Israel's king, uh, realizing that his pursuit and desire to kill David is a bad thing, but it's firstly a sin against God. David says to Saul, if, you, if it is the Lord who has stirred up this in you, Saul, then let my blood fall to the earth, away from the presence of the Lord. And Saul Saul realizes that he has failed as God's king. He has missed the mark that God entrusted to him. And he says, I have sinned. And then David, we read in Psalm 51. Now David didn't miss too many people with his sin. And he confesses in Psalm 51. I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before you. He's David and this Holy Spirit just on his case. And then he says to God, against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil. There's no mention of Bathsheba even though, or Uriah or these people, even though he has done wickedly to them. Sin is fundamentally disordered heart, dislocated heart toward God. So that we no longer are, are, are bent toward loving his word as right and truthful. We no longer love his good design or trust his good design and what it says about us positionally uh, as his creation. Sin totally disfigures us at the core of what motivates our desires, affections and activities. And we will never be whole, never be at peace until this disorder, this disordered loves, this dislocated heart are healed and, and put back to where they belong. Augustine, he's a 4th, 5th century church father, kind of father of theology. Probably no one has thought more about sin than this dude. Um, or maybe Martin Luther did. He's a 16th century reformer. But Augustine said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you something is terribly wrong and we know it and we feel it and this is what it is so paul writing in the new testament describes sin as a power or a force that rules humanity it's what we live in accordance with saying things like that we are slaves to sin in romans 6 6 and that that sin lives in our motivational core so is that the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. That's all through Romans 7. But this force, this condition is not an unwelcome or hostile intruder. It is an encouraged and enjoyed preference to loving God, trusting our lives into his design for them. Something Paul makes tragically, painfully clear in Romans 1, uh, 21 to 25, where people are depicted as pursuing their desires uh, uh, in their darkened hearts, elevating their wisdom over God's, loving God's creation more than they love him. And then in 2 Thessalonians 2, 12, people, writes, uh, people are condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They willfully chose and participated in just living lives that the way, not the way God has designed them to be lived. Sin is not something that we are mere victims of. Sin is something we nurture and participate in. As James says in James 1, 14 to 15, sin springs to life from the core of our beings, if you like, when people are lured and enticed by their own desires, what, what resides here. Then when, desire, uh, when desi then desire, when it is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. 
within the human heart. Sin is this tough, kind of fibrous, fallen life whose nature is just to possess and to possess and to enslave and to own and to disfigure and destroy. James' description here is pretty much a retelling of what transpired in the passage we read from Genesis this morning with a heart that was created with a bias, a leaning toward loving and trusting God, was deceived into doubting and disobeying God. Misguided desire gave birth to sin, and then sin gave birth to death. In Genesis 2, we found that, that real uh, historic story of Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 2, it's kind of painted a little bit more artistically, a, bit, a little bit more figuratively. And they represent humanity in the Garden of Eden in a time of testing, or as uh, Bruce Waltke in his commentary is just awesome on Genesis, but he calls it humanity on probation. We don't know a lot about this setting other than uh, it is a picture of what God's perfect creation can be. Where God is uniquely present with Adam and Eve, who he has placed in the garden as priests and guardians of the garden not guardians of the galaxy. And he has provided for them with abundance. And they have no need. Included in this provision is this tree of life. We read about that in chapter 2, verse 9. And commentators say this tree of life is a provision giving humans the potential for life in its highest potency, representing life that transcends the natural. This tree does not merely represent the length of life, but the quality of life. And I can't help but hear Jesus' words. And I have come to give you life and life in full, a quality of life connected to a source of life. And even the work that they undertake is joyful. These guardians of the garden are to nurture and to cultivate and protect and and look after this place. However, there is another tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this tree is the one single thing in all of creation that is not needed to be fully human. This tree represents knowledge and power only appropriate for God. To be fully human is to depend on God, to depend on his revelation. This tree represents the one prohibition uh, that demonstrates humanity's love and trust in God as good. He's good. Essentially, it is saying, don't do this. Don't seek this because you love me. You trust me. You know I am for you. You know I am good. To reach out and to seize it for ourselves, to seize its produce is to seek our own power uh, over life rather than life found in God. This tree is good. There's nothing wrong with this tree. There's nothing bad with this tree. Nothing in creation is bad or has the potential for evil. It's just that this tree belongs exclusively to God. The sin and its resulting death, the judgment that comes from reaching out to this tree that enters into the world is not a product of this tree. It is a consequence of Adam and Eve's rather like irrational, just utter madness, but illicit act of unfaithfulness and desire for autonomy, to know morality, to have wisdom and power apart from God. In fact, in spite of God, even perhaps over God. Now Genesis records that Adam and Eve, though, lived in and experienced love and trust and fidelity toward God, his word, uh, his law, if you like, his moral character, until a serpent entered the garden, uh, animated by or, or representing the adversary of God. Satan came in and and entered the garden. Now, as guardians of the garden, one of their jobs was to kick that dude to the curb, but they didn't. And so he leads them down a path that James describes with subtle guise and manipulation. The adversary speaks about divine matters and uses speech to introduce confusion and mistrust. 
God is holding you down, holding you back. God is not loving. He's not good. He's stingy. He's a killjoy. God is actually limiting your humanity. The DNA of sin drifts out with every word into the hearts of Adam and Eve. It's incredible. You see, sin does not originate in humanity or the garden. It incredibly comes from heaven. The evidence is limited, but based on passages like Isaiah 14 and 2 Peter and Jude 6, it seems that Lucifer and some angels, due to pride, they they didn't accept their positions in creation. Lucifer, an angel of great power, of great dignity, kind of, I'm going to say this horrendously poorly, but kind of cuts up rough, has a hard time taking the, in the fact that humanity takes the center stage in creation. They are God's image bearers, no, no, not him, not the morning star. And they have the ability to, to create and to reproduce, and they are the center of God's affection and all that he's des- doing. And in response to that, and the language we get is pride, uh, decides that he will change his position a willful choice that saw him and his followers condemned for their rebellion and assigned to judgment it's like it's just like that like the universe the, the universe is not dualistic there's not two uh competing powers it's just god and anything that moves against him it's 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 not it's not dualistic satan though takes one last shot He will put his failed plan into the hearts of the image bearer and in doing so subvert them to not image God, but to image him. And he will rule one way or the other. This is the great offense of sin. This is creation completely missing the mark of what it was designed to do and choosing another more more incredibly offensive way of living humanity is created to live by faith in god's word not by professed self-sufficiency and knowledge in genesis 3 6 to 7 we read with painful brevity where things went terribly wrong as adam and eve participated in what's called the fall of humanity and, and the changing of their natures from a state of loving and trusting faithfulness in god to a state of sin from blessing to curse In the blink of an eye, the entire cosmos is plunged into disorder and confusion and something has gone terribly wrong. Respect for God is replaced with rebellion, a clear conscience uh, consumed with guilt and fear. The blessing of creation is replaced with physical and spiritual frustration and eternal punishment. Viewing God as a friend to walk with is replaced to viewing him as an enemy to hide from. Trust and love replaced with fear and indifference, even hatred. Intimacy with God replaced with distance. Honesty replaced with lying and deceit, selfishness. Selflessness replaced with selfishness. Peace replaced with restlessness. Responsibility replaced with blaming and pointing. From this, Don Carson says, consumed with our own self-focus, we desire to manipulate and dominate others. Here is the beginning of fences, of rape, of greed, of malice, of nurtured bitter, bitterness, of war. And all of these symptoms, all of these tragedies and terrors because the image bearer failed to love and trust God. Trust his word, his law, trust his moral character and willfully chose to acquire what was reserved for God alone. And the evidence and the conclusion of Scripture is that Adam, who represents uh, all the members of the human race, in this time of probation, in this time of testing in the Garden of Eden, his sin becomes a universal condition of humanity. When Adam sinned, all humanity fell and became in his likeness, having a tendency towards mistrusting God, disobeying God, failing to faithfully trust and love God. And it's in all our hearts, whether we're being moral or immoral, 
religious or irreligious. Sin bends our motives, bends the motives of these actions to be all about self, not, not God. The Apostle Paul explains in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. The psalmist David, reflecting as far back as he can on his life, again in that psalm we mentioned earlier, Psalm 51, and verse 5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And he's not coming up with excuses about what he did. He's, he's just looking at the nature of who he is. A similar thing is affirmed in Psalm 58. Even from birth, the wicked go astray. From the womb, they are wayward, spreading lies. Adam sinned and God counted all humanity guilty as well. God saw sin as belonging to the whole of humanity and therefore it's guilt and it's condemnation as well. Humility is needed here. The Bible repeatedly declares that God is always perfect, solely sovereign, powerfully good. God knows far, God's knowledge is far beyond ours. So humanity's condition is not unjust, nor is it unfair. You see, it's not our environments or our experiences that make us bad or evil. Environments and systems don't create wickedness. These systems, these environments, whatever they are, they magnify or they aggravate what is already there. Deep within the human heart, deep within the heart of humanity is mistrust of God, a leaning toward not needy God, rejecting God, depending on self. The heart is now bent toward the lie of the garden that we can be like God, that we don't need God, that he isn't good, that he's trying to limit our humanity. We want our lives to revolve around these distorted views of happiness, our own glory instead of of God's happiness, his glory, what pleases him. In sin, we seek to use all things for our own sake, including God. There can be selfish motives for why you come here today. You want to to manipulate God. You want to impress God. You want to to tip the scales to your side so you can say, look at me. As Luther, Martin Luther, the 16th century reformer says, our hearts are curved in on themselves. It's a failure to be who we were created to be. So whether we're being cruel or kind or nice or nasty, our impulse, our motivation is self-glory, self-gratification, the ability to be superior over others, even over God. Again, as Paul writes in Romans 3.23, that all have fallen short of the glory of God. It's a universal condition. It's what went terribly wrong. The psalmists agree in Psalm 14. They all have gone astray. They are all alike corrupt. There is none that does good. No, not one. And David in Psalm 143 says, No man living is righteous before you. Solomon, the wisest man to ever live. Now there's a dude who did everything. There is no man who does not sin. No one without a heart curved in on itself. We may not like the doctrine of sin, but if it's actually understood, it leads to something strange, something that we've never dreamed of. It leads to compassion and it leads to humility because we realize that no one stands any taller than anybody else, that all people are in need of saving grace. You can no longer look at the world with some a subjective moral line and say they are bad people they are good people you don't get to feel superior to 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 anyone nor do you get to self-loathe and say you're worse than anyone you can only say i am a sinner in need of god's grace in need of having my heart remade having it transformed. G.K. Chesterton remarks that Christianity has an unattractive at first doctrine of original sin. However, if you wait for the results of this belief, you will encounter sympathy. You will encounter brotherhood. It builds communities of grace. Why? 
Because you come to see that everyone, everyone is having the same need as you, the same guilt before God as you. The Christian doctrine of sin is not uh, where you're good or you're bad, you know, these categories, but rather there's this saying, it's just another beggar, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Sin, though, does not have the last word. Sin does not destroy God's plan. Sin never limits God's power to act, it ne- and it never stops from God from doing good. Even in the worst evil, God uses a freely chosen, willful, responsible sin of his creatures to become a vehicle in which his love and glory are seen. The extent of God's love and his commitment to us is seen in his unwillingness to abandon the object of his love, even when that object fails to achieve its desired end, even when creation failed to do what God designed it to do. He does not abandon it. Immediately as the effects of sin take hold of Adam and Eve and the evidence of their fallen condition is seen in their shame and their blaming and their hiding, God is pastoral. He walks them through their offenses by asking them a series of questions that we read this morning in Genesis 3, 8 to 13. Where are you? Who told you this? Did you eat? God is counseling humanity, trying to get them to see their failure, how they missed the mark. He is seeking to redeem. God does not turn up all kind of off the chain, raging, demanding that for the next six million years they work off this offense. They can't, and they just simply won't. So God tends to their immediate needs and then speaks a promise to their greatest need, the removal of sin. We didn't read it this morning. We had to keep reading on. In Genesis 3.15, God promises that someone mightier than sin and Satan will come and he will reverse all that sin has disordered and all that sin has distorted. He moves toward, not away. And this is a foretaste of what God plans to do in Jesus, to seek us, to reverse the work of the serpent, and to restore paradise. Tim Keller says this, the serpent used a tree to put a lie into our hearts. Jesus will use a tree to take the lie out. But not only take that lie out, but take care of the guilt attached to that lie. To make it possible for our hearts to once again be warmed with affection for God. To to make our hearts once again be biased, be motivated toward affection for God. Loving God, loving his word and loving his character. So Paul explains in Romans 5.15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned, Through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation of all men, of all people, so one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life of all men, of all people. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience... Many will be made righteous. The first Adam was given a command about a tree in a perfect, idyllic setting, like nothing he needed. And he was told, Obey me about that tree and you will live. Jesus is the second Adam. He's the one being pictured here as the second Adam. He is given a command about another tree in a terrible dark garden alone praying was told by God obey me about this tree and you will die obey me about the cross and you will bear the weight of their punishment 
their guilt, their shame. One horrific cosmic act being undone and reversed by another. The first Adam failed and sin became our reality. The second Adam did not and grace became a possibility. New hearts that pulse with a quality of life that is not curved in, but curved out, curved up and curved out. There is something wrong with the world today, but God has acted. Jesus is God's answer to sin. He is the sin bearer, the life giver, taking responsibility for the sin in an event that we call Easter, where Jesus pays for at all levels, including death, the offenses for the offenses and the demands of sin. You can read about that in 1 Peter 2, 22 to 24. And he is raised to life because having committed no sin, sin could not hold him, had no claim on him. And now he offers this quality of life, the quality of life that the tree offered, the quality of life Jesus now offers. It will become a reality, a full reality for us in the resurrection. We are no longer slaves to sin, but people who now lean toward loving God and loving each other. Not in our power, but in the power of the risen Lord Jesus and his gift to us in the Holy Spirit. They are coming attractions that we're going to get into in the next few weeks. Let's pray. I mean, God, we thank you that um, there is this real robust description of what is wrong with us that doesn't leave us just hopeless it takes us on a journey toward profound hope it tells us that even though there is something profoundly wrong with humanity it is moving toward a profound and incredible moment of grace and restoration our prayer this morning is that we still wrestle with this sense of guilt this sense of shame this sense of 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 mistrusting god of doubting god of not seeing him as good and loving that your spirit would come and say look at the cross look at this message from god that he would not withhold any aspect of himself to bring you back into fellowship with him to bring you back into what is what it is to be truly human to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior is to begin the restoration of what it is to be truly human. To have our hearts warmed with affection for God again. That we would trust his word and his law again. That we would trust his good character. That even though the world describes a way of being human, we trust the way God has described we are to be human. Our prayer is that that would be that, that that would be breathed to life in all of us, that we would trust it deeply. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.